even. I do like the fact that we have two chairs that are the same height. Unlike, how many months did we go by where it was like, every every time we'd finish a show, I'd be like, we need to get new chairs. Like, probably three months. I think it was about three months. I it, had that, uh, that cannon chair. You yeah. used the cannon chair, which like made you lower. Like I know, it's good, it's good. All right, you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. All right, here we go. Jared Poland Frono's photo.com and welcome to raw talk episode number 54 this week i have on a really good guest named bill kramer he runs wonderful machine if you don't know that website uh you should check out wonderful machine they are pretty much the new age uh representative for photographers i know that zach arias is represented there adam lerner is represented there i have an application in my hands to be represented there really really fantastic interview uh a ton of information i did not talk very much which is great uh bill gave so much really good content for you guys to to think about about what they do and how it works and it's really important for for today's generation of photographers so coming up we've got photo news we've got gear of the week we have some other discussion topics and Stephen, yes, sir. Welcome to the show, yeah, glorious show. Let's kick it off, photo news. Uh, okay. L- wait, let's kick it. Yeah, yeah. Wait, Tone Loke. What? Tone Loke? Huh? You don't know who Tone who? Loke is? Stephen. I'm bad with names though. Tone so Loke. Give me uh. An funky example. Cole Medina. I got nothing. Brown out. You got nothing on the Funky Cole Medina. I got nothing. That's one Tone Loke song, and the other song is uh. Funky Cole Medina. <laughs> He's got one other song that's bigger than Funky. What is it? How does it go? All right, never mind. Go ahead. Tone uh, Loke was cool. He got his voice, <laughs> his raspy voice, because I think his mother would give him bourbon or something to put him to sleep as a kid, and it kind of burnt like his vocal cords. That's not good. No, it's not good. But anyway. uh, speaking of raspy voice, I'm a little uh, under the weather, so my voice might be a little raspy today why's your voice raspy steven because i got really bad allergies and every time the seasons change for like that week my body like sucks and every tries to readjust turn, change 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 there is a season turn turn for everyone i just did like every <laughs> other word of the birds i think it, i think it's the birds all right sorry go ahead um, I'll try not to interrupt. So kicking it off, Nikon just filed a patent for a camera that will allow you to swap out sensors. That's pretty cool. Uh, the diagrams online look like you can easily switch sensors, much like memory cards. Take out the back, you pop a new one in, whether it be like an infrared or black and white sensor. Let me finish real quick. Uh, I'm if- just shaking my head. <laughs> I'll wait till the end. This isn't the first time Nikon though has tried this. Apparently back in 2010, two different patents for similar innovations came up. Uh, although both were for mirrorless cameras, so this is for a true DSLR. So we'll see if this actually comes to light. What do you think about it? What Now's do time I think about in. it? Yeah. Give me a break. The most One of the most expensive parts of the camera is the sensor, I, know. I think. And it's just like, you're not going to interchange that. What, are you going to send your camera back and they're going to change it out? Well, unless I mean, they made it like a digital back, like a medium format kind of style. Right. I guess. that. Yeah, I guess, but... How often do you need the? Ch- I, I don't know. I don't know I, if it's cost effective. I guess they just fire file patents just to protect themselves. Yeah, and I don't know if it meant like you know cro- you know switch like from a crop to his full frame sensor. I think it meant more like infrared well, or, do you or those know specialty what sensors. Back in the day with film, the whole f- the the major thing was we're going to build digital film. All right, we're going to put a digital back. We're going to take the door off of the camera, the 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 film door, mm-hmm. and replace it with a digital back basically in the door yeah that that was the thing or there was somebody that was making a canister that had a thing across of it that had the sensor built into it but there's so much that went into it that it it never worked so this probably won't work i i can't see interchangeable sensors working some people are yeah i just can't see how how are you not going to get your hands all over it or it's got to have some kind of protective i don't know hands all over it protective Anything else, Stephen? No, that's about it. Your sexual connotations are are way too way too much for this episode. I know. I'm a little. All right, go ahead. My bad. Uh, Kodak's legacy in the film world will officially live on. Uh, introducing Kodak Alaris, it's the UK business that took over Kodak's personalized and document imaging business. Uh, they say to expect new innovations where instant printing is concerned, uh, with the rise of smartphone and portable devices what? lately. And uh, they have no plans to cut down on the film side either, but uh, they won't be, that won't be like their main focus. They're going to be mainly focusing on the printing side of that. That is, the, again, printing is what got them 
out of business in the first well that's not the only thing but yeah. they went into the home printing market and that failed miserably it was horrible their inkjet thing to say that you're going to innovate in the home printing market most people don't print their freaking photos okay that's just how we Especially live today. these days because they don't just, of smartphones well, and they don't portable print devices. because of that they go up to facebook if you want to print you go to adorama pics and you make a real freaking print or whoever mm-hmm. you're going to order from but most people today aren't going to take their instagram pictures and be like oh, i need to print this out instantly look at look at polaroid yeah you know they try to do that with that zinc printer have you ever seen that zinc printer no it sucks because it looks like a dye sublimation thing, but it's horrible. It's expensive. It's like it's like Fuji having their Instax cameras, which they just put out a two hundred and ten dollar Instax camera, which I can't wait to get my hands what on. What were they before? You can buy one for like eighty bucks. But oh, this okay. is like a designer one. Oh, yeah. They've done a great job with marketing that thing. You can get it at Urban Outfitters and stuff, and buy the and film there. What are, what's the size of their little film? It's little. It's like one and a half by one and a half, or it's, bigger. No, no, no. It's it's not square. It's just small. Oh, okay. There's a small one and there's the big size and it's about a buck a shot. Got it. It's still expensive. Yeah, that is still pretty bad, okay. but that's whatever. Uh, so yeah, we'll see what happens with that. We'll see if uh, they go out of business too, but that's going to be their main focus is printing. Uh, moving on, we have a British photographer named Jason Sheldon. He won a copyright infringement settlement, which earned him $32,300 US dollars to be specific. It's like 20,000 pounds or something like that. Um, the wow factor for this is that the original offer to settle it was less than 1% of that, a mere $242 by the infringer, which the infringer, bringing that up, uh, basically a backstage photo Sheldon captured in July of 2011 of pop star Kesha partying with rap duo LMFAO. Um, Party rock! Basically a Nottingham nightclub. How does that song go again? Party rocking on. I just know like the melody. I don't Everybody's know. gonna have, have a, a good, good time. Then <laughs> and then lose your mind. Everybody's gonna. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when we met with that dude backstage, and you guys looked like twins. Yeah, and he smelled. <laughs> <laughs> he just finished performing, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, but he smelled like he smelled, like his clothes haven't been washed in years. Well, he's and touring. LMFA broke up. Um, so yeah, there's a picture L-M-F-A-O. he took L-M-F-A-O. backstage of Did, Kesha and Steven, them. hold on. Did you know that a reader sent me an email one day and said they don't use that language in their house when I sent out an email that said um, L-M-F-A-O in it? They're like, we don't use that language. They, I they res- didn't realize it was It didn't matter. An act. I responded back and I said, what do you mean you don't use that language? And I knew what they were getting at. Like, we don't say that. I'm like, it's an acronym. You don't actually say anything. It's L-M-F-A-O. All right? And it's a band. It's the name of the band. So get a life. I don't think they're a reader anymore. Yeah, I, I, probably not. <laughs> um, but... Basically, they used that photo, a Nottingham nightclub used it in an ad that they put out and uh, saying, they basically said that since the picture has been posted on Tumblr, that it must be free to reuse at their will. And that's why he came back saying, no, I want like $10,000 or like, no, we can give you 242. And then he took him to court and won $32,000. Well, good for him. Crazy. Yeah. Good for him because it, just it, because it shows, it's posted online. Yep. But the question here is you and I, have you shot Kesha? I have not. So have I? There no, I is haven't. a model release, but this was at a bar. Uh huh. Was this at a club, or was uh, this, this at was, a performance? This was a ad that they used. But the photo, where did it come from? The photo was just some backstage somewhere. It didn't say specifically where. Because it just—I I wonder if the guy signed a model release, signed the the form that Kesha gives out, because she puts out a form that is really restrictive. Yeah, I don't. She know. doesn't do it. Her they didn't really go into details it. about that. All right. Well, good for him for for finding his photo and not taking the two hundred and forty dollars and saying, "Screw you guys, I'm taking you to court to get my thirty two thousand dollars." Yeah, and it shows that you can still pretty much win uh, these copyright infringement cases. Good. They're still something that's meaningful these days. Good. Um, Rare photos next up that were taken with the Kodak number no. one camera over 125 years ago have surfaced online. This is really cool. Uh, for those that don't know, the Kodak number no. one camera was pretty much the first consumer camera offered to the public. Uh, this was, I think, in 1888 when these pictures were taken. So there's a whole set of them that the National Media Museum put up. Uh, they're high resolution, they're circular images, because I guess the film itself or, or the lens. Uh, just created a circular image. Sure. So it was really cool. Um, they're all high-res images, and yeah, they're all mine. Now that's what it's specifically. This is a it, this is a Kodak. It's called a Graphic Number Zero. See, I wonder if that came out before. No, this is nineteen 
about 1909 okay. to about 1921. Yeah, they're saying these were the late 1800s. Right, because that I, that makes sense. This thing is insane. I've talked about this on the website, but... I still can't believe you got that. I'm jealous $18. of that. $18. For those that don't know if, they're, if, you're, if you're listening, listening in the podcast, home. yeah, it's just this really old antique looking camera. It's called a Kodak number zero graphic, and it's... I paid eighteen dollars for this. Out it of looks the, more like a bomb than like a camera. Well, at first when I saw it, I thought <laughs> it was a battery. battery. Yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a funny story about it to prolong this. Um, there was a girl who had her eye on it from across the way. Did you, she did was you? waiting for me to put it down, <laughs> and she's like, "Are you gonna get that?" I'm like, "Now I am," because she's like, "You know," I'm like, "Yeah, I'm not putting it's eighteen dollars. I'm not even gonna haggle with." What, the guy. Was she a photographer or was she just like? Wanted well, she it? ended up buying a uh, like a. I watched because she bought like a video, uh, an eight millimeter camera, which was stupid. Did, did camera. she have glasses with like no frames? She was a hipster. Yeah. <laughs> she was a hipster. I figured she was. Um, Hold on. Before you go okay. forward, I want to talk about Squarespace real quick because gotcha. I want I have a correction from last week or the promotion that I've been doing. Oh, well, yeah, I, I don't know where the cross up was, but Squarespace made me aware we've been giving that code fro nine 20 percent off. Now the code for October is fro 10. If you want to sign up for squarespace.com slash fro use code fro 10 and they'll give you 10 percent off. It's 10 percent off your first order. OK, I was mistaken. I thought it was 10 percent off forever. Mea culpa, my bad. First order, do you mean like first month or like no, first year? No, it means your first order. Okay, Either so you order it by a month or you, or you order f- it by a year. So it's so you could get 10% off an entire year because you pay it up front. Got it. So that would be instead of $10 a month, it's only going to be $9 a month. And oh, no, 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 no. It's $8 a month when you prepay for a year. So you get 10% off of that. Cool. So it's not bad at all. So I'm sorry for anybody who I confused or was confused. There was a mistake made. Just letting you know. My personal site's now Squarespace. If you like what I've done there, like I said, it only took me 30 minutes, and I've been getting emails from people. Somebody sent me an email and goes, and it looks like you only spent 30 minutes. <laughs> Hon- honest to God, though, <laughs> I like the site. It's, it's simple. It's, it's simple. It's a simplistic and design. So what? It That's took what me 30 minutes. The site that the guy sent me, he's like, I build websites. He sent me a piece of shit website. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I wanted to respond back and go... I hope you didn't. I know you may have spent more than half an hour for this, but it sucks. Was it like defined sucked? Like, sucked. It was just it, it graphically looked like crap. Was it cluttered? It just, no, it wasn't. Cl- it just didn't. It didn't flow right. It just looked not. It didn't look good. Got it. And I and I'm not saying that my site is the my site is nowhere near the end all and be all. But for what I am personally going for, for something so simple, an easy design to use, and easy to 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 host and everything, I went with it. Yeah. So anyway. 10% off, use code FRO10 for October, uh, squarespace.com slash FRO, and you'll get 10% off your first order. So if you only if you sign up for a month, you get 10% off that one month. If you sign up for the year, which I do recommend signing up for the year uh, because you'll save more money and, yeah, 10% off. Okay, sorry. Go ahead. You're good. Uh, behind the scenes footage of 52 GoPros working together to create bullet time video is now on the web. Uh, a guy named Devin Graham I think he goes under the name Devin Supertramp or something like that online. Oh, Devin Supertramp. He's so hot right now. He recently put up a video of dogs running and stopping uh, in midair with like the Matrix-like effect, that full time effect. So he put up a whole behind-the-scenes video showcasing how he did it, how he set it up. Uh, He had a custom mounting rig that they had built for the cameras specifically. Um, they had. They also explain, which is pretty interesting for those at home wondering, just corporate sponsorship, po- sponsorship wise. Uh, he explained like how they made that into the video and how they paid the video off because of that. And what was the sponsor? Uh, it was this um, this dog grooming thing. It was like this brush that dogs Wait, lick. Is it a Floby? Uh, I don't know for the name dogs. Of it. I don't think so. Do you know what a Floby is? No, Stephen. What you don't know what a Floby is? No. You, it it sucks and it cuts. <laughs> uh, I don't even want to know what it is. Steven, so you take a vacuum hose. I got it. And it sucks, right? You put on this attachment. <laughs> all right? It's called the Floby. It has freaking like metal shears inside. So it sucks your hair and it cuts it at the same time to a certain length through this freaking thing. It was the biggest as seen on TV thing in the history of seen on TV things. When was that? In the 80s and 90s. Like before I was born? No, but also it's one of the famous lines in Wayne's World. I don't it remember. It sucks and it cuts. Oh. I just watched Wayne, Wayne's World too, the first 
not for the first time, but for Wayne's the first World time in a two while. Or Wayne's one World and one. two back to back. It's time for it was Wayne's on, like, World Fuse three. or something. It's yeah. time. They well, got Dumb and Dumber coming. It's time for and Wayne's like, World. And like Myers hasn't been in a movie since like Austin Powers because he made plenty. Of, no, he was in the the Love Guru. You're right. He was, but I don't know. I guess more of like a comedic factor. Like he hasn't been in one of those SNL he hasn't type been videos in a, in a movie while. In a while. He's probably back end producing and stuff. He's probably just making still millions off the reruns and all that. Um, Anyway, moving on, yeah, so it's really interesting to see just how they put the 52 GoPros together. And he also talked about lining up the GoPros in post and how it took like five hours just to line up and sync everything because, again, 52 videos. Um, And then next up we have, going back in time again, uh, a super rare photo of Abe Lincoln has been discovered for the first time. They pretty much confirmed it. Uh, It's of him in the crowd at the Gettysburg Address and originally thought... To not to be real. Four score and seven years ago. Because apparently originally they had... Our forefathers <laughs> set forth unto the future of this nation that I am going to be the president. Uh, I'm already the president of the United States. My name is Abe Lincoln. For those of you who don't know, that's honest, Abe. Just take a penny out of your pocket and you'll see me on it. Abe Blinkenstein. Not Vampire Hunter. <laughs> I still don't understand that idea they had behind that movie. Um, now, apparently, though, there was an, an original photograph taken at the same place that they thought Abe Lincoln was, and now they're saying, they're contradicting that, saying that they don't think that was him, and the new photograph, which has him placed in a different position, is the real Abe Lincoln. So we'll see if, if that uh, actually is yeah. the real one. They're saying it is. It looks like, wh- what I love about these old, the, f- the fact that these old photos are still discovered and that they think that Abe Lincoln's in it. I saw an old one where they, they found it where Abe Lincoln was at the White House. It was like a photo and it was somebody else in it. And the way that they figured out it was him, one, it was the hat, but it was how tall he was compared to the person that he was next to. Really? Because he was a much taller gentleman of the time. So it, it was pretty cool. And, and this one, he's kind of sitting down. So he's I don't sitting know how down because they... he's waiting for the address. There's also one that showed up a couple years back where he came in on a carriage uh, that they found him. They think it was him. I just, how fascinating. What year? 1860s? Something like that, uh, yeah. The, because the war was in the 60s, I yeah, believe. Yeah, yeah. The fact that, I mean, photography going back the eighteen that far eighteen sixties and thinking about how they did this with these cameras and the long exposures and 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 I love like I bought the Matthew Brady book and we all know the Matthew Brady was the Civil War photographer yet he gets a lot of the recognition when all the other people did it and uh, did photos for him because he was part of the studio and he also set up a lot of the death photos which he probably shouldn't have but he yeah. manipulated the images by having people act dead in the frame which is interesting just to to create images but i love photos from the 18 late 1800s yeah they're just so fascinating to see that stuff because you didn't have that before in any time in history and it just every time i look back on old photos it always it's it's another world to me because it's it's black and white one and it's just like the, the attire they're wearing everything that's going on in that world is completely different than today and and what i also love i i love when you're in a location and you see the what it used to look like exactly i, I want to just the before trans- and after ones you, i like when they do that well speaking of before and afters steven i've been searching on tumblr naughty tumblr there's a naughty Tumblr? Well, there's a before and after. It's so awesome. People with clothes on and then people with clothes <laughs> off. I haven't seen this. I'll show you later. <laughs> it's really good stuff. I should have that on photo news. No, that's not photo news. <laughs> but it is. It's before and after. Anyway, <clears throat> that's naughty Tumblr. But I love... Na- naughty news. I, I love <clears throat> when Next you week. see um, locations, what they used to look like and yeah. what they are now. I just love the feel of going... Or going somewhere and being like, what was it like 200 years ago? What was it like 300 years ago right here? What did it look like? And it's just a cool game. I, I'm weird. I play games like that. But that's, I think about it. No, I'm a huge history uh, geek when it comes to that stuff. Like, I love old buildings, for example. Like, your building, how old is this? Like, 100 this is years over old? over 100 years at this point. Like, these bricks are like 100 years old. This was an ele- And these floors are original floors. Yeah, and that's... This was that an elevator factory. That's awesome. Yeah, we have all the... We still have to do the cribs to show people the old stuff. Yeah, we got to well, do cribs I found something through. out interesting, by the way. Across the street is another building, the one with the Land Rovers. So I was talking to that owner. He has a billboard on the roof, which isn't being used right now. I want to put I shoot raw on it, but that's a <laughs> totally different story. That was the pump room for the heat for this building, for the whole complex. Really? Did it. So he said when he first got there, there was a wall, a uh, cinder block wall that you could clearly see used to be an opening. So he broke it down and he walked through it 
and it took him from uh, it took him under the street to the building to this building. Oh wow! Yeah, he's like you couldn't get all the way through because they put in pipes and stuff. Wonder when the last time that was walked through. I don't know, but it was he bought the building in two thousand and one. He said. That's awesome. Yeah, which is probably worth a hell of a lot more than you know um, he bought in twelve years I'm ago. Sure, I'm that, sure that investment is well, well paid off. Anyway, I, I we digress. But I, uh, speaking of history, yes, History Channel, love it. Um, Modern Marvels, awesome. Modern Marvels is I watch Modern. Marvels I can watch tuna, it all day, every day. Modern Marvels, cars. Modern Marvels, farming. Everything. Modern Marvels, rice. Modern Marvels. Um, I really like how it's made too. I don't how think it's they made have it on. good. Uh, that's on Discovery. That's now on. Okay, yeah. And that's a good one. And then they, and then they have factory made. But one of the best, if you love history, is the men that built America. Yeah, I saw that too. Unbelievable. Everything I just on love the history, that history channel stuff nonstop. All right, let's go. Uh, last up, we have a wedding photographer scammed couples out of $140,000, and he, uh, he faces 70 felony charges from, I guess, 70 different couples. Um, a New Jersey photographer, his name is Michael De Rubis, or Rubius. Uh, he also worked under the alias Michael Distacio, or Distacio. Uh, he's never even delivered the final photos of any of those wedding clients, which is a real well, the, bummer. The weird thing is he shows up to shoot the weddings. And he shows up to shoot them and just never delivers. So, And a lot of them paid, they, it says, uh, around 7000 per wedding. Which which should say something to you people at home right now, is that there's money to be made. Yep. Even if a douchebag like this can somehow sell people on the fact that he's the wedding photographer and his wife and his son, they'll do video. They did whatever it took to just steal money from people. And, and to, to make things even worse, uh, which I don't know how he got away with this, uh, apparently a decade ago he was banned from working as a photographer in New York from Attorney General uh, Elliot Spitzer who sued him and his Speaking wife Speaking of Elliot Spitzer frauding 60 clients uh, in pretty news. much the same way That's a, see, So you're banned from working in New York You know how you get banned You go to f- jail Yeah Alright You're an a- You What's his name? Uh, Michael De Rubius I Michael think. De Rubius You sir are an a- <laughs> Seriously Do you have to be an a- and he turned himself in, apparently. First off, you got the job, man. You got the job. People pay you money because they liked what you did. That's the All hard All you part. had to do, you showed up. All you had to do was deliver something. Even if you f- suck. Oh, this is going to be an explicit podcast. Earmuffs. Even if, I'm sorry, I apologize. Can you bleep me? <laughs> sure. Seriously, can you go in and bleep I will. me? I will. Just for the Fs, the F words. Since not you said it on stuff. here, I will. Yeah, please do that. Don't <laughs> forget. Not, I won't. Because I'm going to be editing it and going through and I'll be like, oh, I got to back up because now I got to bleep them. Yeah, just please bleep me. I'm sorry. I don't because there's kids that listen. <laughs> <laughs> Naughty. And hour. they don't use that language in their but house. Keep, so. Well, I'm sure they do, but they don't have to hear it if they're in the car and listen. Anyway, I, I apologize, uh, but I use the F word. But seriously, you're an a- <laughs> Bleep that too. <laughs> Steven, bleep that also. <laughs> All right. Um, but yeah, he, he turned himself in though. But, but the, still. Point of the, the point of this is that one, he talked to people into giving him a job. Two, he showed up to the weddings. And they had to like him enough. To they, yes, you had to do something right. You had to so be personable, all you had to do I'm was, assuming. Uh, I mean, 140 grand's a lot. Yeah. That's a lot of money, but that's not 70 lot. clients worth. Yeah. That means that's only $2,000 a wedding. He was charging $7,000. And, and well, I, I guess it was depending on the package and yeah, stuff but like that. that if, he's, if he has... 10 weddings that are $5,000. And this might have been over time, too. This might have been the past 10 years, you know. Of maybe he started small, and now he's at the $7,000 mark. But I don't understand how you can keep building, building a business if within when 10 you years never turn anything and in? never return I read some photos. of the comments that people left. Some of them were like, yeah, he was horrible. We can't get in touch with him. He did everything. Yeah, it was like zero rating out of 10 or something. It's just horrible. Yeah. It just... you Please don't be douchebags in this world. Yeah. Just... It, uh, uh, and I, and I understand wedding photos take months to get back, and that, that's that's okay, that's appropriate, but not the one person uh, they interviewed on the news channel that uh, got robbed from this dude. Uh, they said, I think, two years ago is when they had their wedding, and like they're they going to give a photo book to their grandma, and she like passed away now. She never even saw any of the photos from the wedding. Like That's just that's yeah. terrible. No, you, uh, my thing with weddings is I try to deliver at least the digital prints, sorry, the digital files within two weeks yeah. or a month. And that's really good. It depends on how busy you that's, are. And that that's is That's a quick turnaround. Well, because I want to get it done so quick. Like my favorite thing are weddings where you shoot it and deliver it. Yeah. Sure, you'll make more money on the tail end doing albums and stuff, but albums always take a year. They just, oh, for, yeah. they take a year. For some reason, it takes a year for them to get done because people either don't choose the images or you just start doing other stuff. I like to shoot and deliver. Shoot the wedding, done with it. come home on that Sunday or Monday, and just spend the first two days of the week going through the 400 keepers, 430 keepers, edit them, 
what I actually like to do is when they're on their honeymoon, I send them a couple. Yeah. Like I go home and I'm like, this is the best shot. And I send it to them. The first week I did. Yeah. I I sent them a couple of the the keepers, the real solid top tens. Yeah. Yeah. And they loved them. What else? Is that all? That is it. That's uh, all the photo news we have. And uh, you might as well sit here for the rest of the show. Yeah. Because I don't think we're going to be much longer. I mean, for the rest of this before the interview. Yeah. Just for anybody out there, we, we record the interviews beforehand. And then Stephen and I sit down here to, to hammer out the beginning. That way it makes it easier on our guests. They just show up. They don't have to wait. Yep. We can do that and cut that interview in after. So coming up after we're done with uh, gear, the gear of the week, you've got that interview. So gear of the week. So as you guys know, Rode has these microphones for the product placement. And they sent this Rode, what is it called? Uh, it's the HS1. Yes. So they want me to try out. Okay, it must be locked again. It's like a waterproof case too. I, they whatever sent it this is. A, so if you're watching at listening on the on the computer, it looks you like may a giant wanna, GoPro. <laughs> well, the case is kind of like a Pelican with a clear top, and this thing is what two ninety nine, I believe. Yeah. So it's a it's a headset microphone that they want me to try and use on air, and here it is. We tested it. It worked. Yeah. We don't know how. I mean, I can't see that it's going to be as boomy as something like we're using. Well, it's it's a lav mic basically. It's it's kind of like a lav mic that. It comes across your mouth. Yeah. Or you can clip it on. They also have a lapel clip with the kit. I don't know why. That comes with it if you wanted to just They also it. have this. Yeah. I can't see someone actually. <laughs> Hello? Actually using it. How's that, Steven? That looks good. Do I look good? Yep. I have a nice stash right Sweet there? Sweet stash. Nice. This is, that would take me about 10 years to grow. How about a flavor saver? <laughs> I got my flavor saver. Flavor saver. Anyway, so it comes with a bunch of different accessories. This isn't... We're going we're gonna to test this out. I think next week we'll try... Steven's going to take this home to use uh, to use with the, uh, the Rode application. Yeah. Because it's kind of similar to the Smart Lab. But really, they gave us this adapter to use that plugs into the back. And this will plug into the phone. And we tested it out. But we're going to probably use it for one segment next week yeah and we'll um, cut in between uh the audio the audio so we can just hear the difference um but really we may use these up at the photo plus show yeah if we're going to do a gorilla pod we're going to do a gorilla podcast on the floor that'd be cool i didn't tell you that yet well we're going to do that <laughs> yeah so this is the gear of the week thing comes in a cool case it's 300 bucks they sent us two of these we're going to test it out and it also has a, an xlr connector that you can buy separately so which is probably what we're going to do to hook it up to the uh, zoom h6 versus having it on your phone i don't know something about the, the phone I'd, I'd rather have it on the h6 well i'd rather have it on the h6 as well but if you are stuck in a rut yeah, and you have oh, yeah, all you have is your sure. iPad or you have the 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 thingy mabobber. Very convenient. You can literally put that whole thing in your pocket and be good to go. Yeah, this this Phone thing you could, all. but not not the whole bag box. No, not that. Yeah. But hey, I got one other thing to talk about. If you guys remember Gary Vaynerchuk, uh, I did a podcast with him back in the day. He has a new book coming out, and the reason I'm talking about it is because it's a book that I think you guys want to read. Um, it's called Jab 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 Right Hook. Still questionable title in my mind. Um, I'm just going to leave this right here. That's cool. Um, The reason I'm promoting his book as a friend is because Gary has taken the time over the last four years to answer my emails, to stay up and talk with me uh, whenever I had a question, to kind of be like a mentor. I've learned a lot from him, and I've read the first book. uh, Well, I've read the first book. I didn't read the second book. Uh, Crush It was one of those books. And the reason that I ended up liking what he did is for the fact that it's no bullshit. You don't have to bleep that. It's no <laughs> BS. You know, what, what Gary opened up my eyes to, uh, actually reaffirmed this, that there are no secrets to being successful. Work your butt off, do this, you know, find what works for you. There's no secrets. And that is why I liked what he came up with. And that Crush It book is great. It's still good if anybody wants to read it. You can get it for pretty inexpensive online. But he's got Jab, 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 Right Hook, um, this one is how to get noticed, I believe, in a noisy world. I think that's what it's called. How to get no- it's, it's basically how to stand out. It, what, why are you smiling at me? I'm just thinking of his, his wine reviews that oh, well, you showed me. Yeah, so if anybody hasn't seen Gary's wine reviews, for six years, he had a new video every day. So what do you think I emulated my site off of? A and guy that made six videos a day. The sniff test, too, so, right? Yeah, the sniff test came from Gary V because he used to sniff wine and he used to give it a sniffy sniff. So I, I, uh, <laughs> I attribute sniff. that to him. I attribute my... Fro knows photo. Vayner Chuck. Vayner Chuck. So I, I emulated a lot of stuff. I just was like, wow. And then I emulated the work ethic because nothing can make up for the work ethic yeah. of busting your ass to keep working hard. But anyway, what this new book is, it, it's how to get noticed in this world online. There's case studies. It's not out yet. It's coming out shortly. But 
Do you I know when it comes out? Soon. Okay. I don't know when, but it's still in pre-order sale. I think it's in November. Gotcha. Maybe it's November 30th. But look, Gary sat down with me for 45 minutes and did a podcast. It's free. Go take a listen to it. If you like what he stands for and you like the things that he says, then go ahead and pre-order the book. I've already pre-ordered mine. And if you like it, it's for you. Then take a listen. If he's too abrasive for you because he's going to curse, so use earmuffs. That's just how he is. If that's not you, then then... And if you don't think that book helps you, then, then don't. You don't have to do anything. I just think that people looking to better brand and market themselves can benefit from this. I wouldn't write this book because it's not something that I could fully articulate. But he went through and there's a ton of case studies on how to be successful here on Facebook, how to be successful here with Twitter, how to be successful in other places. So if just one thing triggers something in your mind out there, one thing that you turn into a major success, then it's worth the price of admission for picking up that book. That's really sure. all I have to say. So, but check out the the raw talk. I don't remember. I'll remind me to post it. it had down to be below. a while ago because that well, was before it was the first I was here. one I did with the GoPro. Okay, it's the very first one. So it's like probably like a year ago or something. No, it's not that long ago. Oh, okay, not not that long ago because I think it's like eighteen maybe. 17. I'll I'll post it down below. But check out the Gary Vaynerchuk thing. Uh, great interview with him. And if you want to learn more about the book, check it out. Yeah. So that is uh, what we've got. We're coming up right now. We got Bill Kramer talking about Wonderful Machine and all of the wonderful things that they do for photographers when you get selected uh, and join the roster. It's one of those things you have to get selected. You're going to hear me talk about that uh, before we start his interview, which is coming up right now. Steven, thank you for your news. Yes, sir. We're going to go to that interview. And then after that interview, stick around because we will wrap up this week's show. Enjoy. All right, guys, we're sitting here with Bill Kramer of Wonderful Machine. That is correct. Yeah. We're going to figure out where you got that name in a minute. But pay attention to this. If you are looking to be discovered and seen in the world as a photographer, be, so be put in a place where people will find you, the right people will find you. This is kind of where you're going to want to be. Now, not every they don't accept everybody, so don't be upset if you do contact them and they say, we like what you've got or keep working towards this and maybe one day we'll add you to the roster. But you do have to, you really have to have killer stuff to make it uh, and, and be a part of the team. Is that about correct? Uh, that's exactly correct. Yeah. I just wanted to let people know that right off the bat. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, we're, we're a curated site, so we're very selective about the photographers we add to the site. Which is good. I mean, I, I wrote notes earlier because I, how many are you up to? Are you up to 700? Uh, we just hit 700. See, that's, that's great. And, and you think about it, you're like, oh, but there's 700 other photographers on the site that I have to compete with uh, trying to get jobs. But if you look at it, they're all over the world. They may not be in the right place for that job that that person's looking for. Mm -hmm. And if you look at Google and you do a photographer search, you're competing now against millions of people. Right. So instead of millions, 700. Yeah. I mean, we've got our, our, in our own internal database, we've got 13,000 photographers that we know of. And there's probably another 13,000 beyond that. So, so it's much better to compete with another 700 than 13,000. Oh, yeah. And yeah. it's maybe not even competing. You may work well together. Mm -hmm. I mean, one person's work may complement yours. Maybe they, I don't know if they hire two people for a shoot ever, but. Well, also every photographer has a different specialty. So on our site, we've got 30 different specialties and we've got any number of locations. So when a, when a client comes to our site, they're going to, they're going to type in Cairo and then they're going to click on reportage and they're going to find a photographer. They're not going to, so not, so it's true. Not every photographer is competing with 600 other photographers. Uh, everybody's uh, only going to be compared against uh, similar photographers in their area. So let, let's take it all the way back to the beginning. You are a photographer. I am. And do you want to give some feet, uh, some, what, what have you done? So, uh, so I graduated uh, from Penn state in 1985 uh, I started my career as a photojournalist. Uh, I worked here in Philadelphia for for the first four years. I, I worked for the Associated Press and the New York Times, uh, mostly as a photojournalist and um, uh, and sort of as a stringer photographer. So uh, so for example, with the AP, um, they would have they had four staff photographers and uh, and they had a couple of stringers. I was sort of their main stringer, so I would do three or four, sometimes five assignments a week for the AP. Um, and then I started working for the New York Times in a similar capacity, shooting news and sports and features. Uh, so I did that for about four years altogether. All along the way, I, I continued to sort of grow my business. I started doing corporate assignments and advertising assignments. Uh, early on, a lot of PR assignments, a lot of ribbon cuttings for banks and grip and grins and headshots. It was the 80s. Yeah. 
And so, um, so I just sort of grew organically. Uh, at the same time, I was doing a lot of assisting. I assisted a guy named Bob Hunsinger on the Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue in 1989, um, and then I uh, and 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 I spent about a year in the early ni- 90s uh, working for a guy named Stephen Mizell, who's a very famous fashion photographer. Huge. So, ha- so I got. He has that building, right? He owns like a whole block or something in New York. It's possible he has done very well. What, I, I what, what did he, you hear? I didn't know that. I'm pretty sure that where he has a place is a long time ago he bought it mm-hmm. in a in a not high end area that has now become a high end area and he just has a huge building there. Oh, uh, are you thinking about Jay Mazel? Yeah, wrong guy. Yeah. So so Jay Mazel's uh, <laughs> a generation older and is like a corporate photographer. Okay. Uh Steven Mizell, M E I S E L is uh maybe early sixties and um, just the most prolific, most amazing fashion photographer I will look it up. ever. Um, but he, uh, back when I was working for him, he was uh, photographing Madonna a lot and just about every supermodel, uh, Christy Turlington and, uh, you know, you name it. Um, so that was a lot of fun. Um, and, uh, and, and so I sort of, over time, sort of transitioned to doing more portrait work uh, where I, I uh, spent about 15 years primarily working for uh, all sorts of consumer magazines, a lot of business magazines like Forbes and Business Week and uh, Bloomberg Markets Magazine and uh, just doing a lot of portraits of all kinds of different people. I worked a lot for Philadelphia Magazine for about 20 years, uh, just, just covering all kinds of assignments for them. Um, and, then, uh, and, then, and then Wonderful Machine happened. So Before we get to the Wonderful Machine, I'm sure people want to know how do you end up getting these gigs with all of these magazines through the years? Um, for me, it just sort of happened very organically. When I was at Penn State, I worked on a student newspaper, which was an amazing experience. We've so, talked about that at length with people because I didn't go to a four-year school, but I said to people, if I ever went to a four-year school, if or if you are going to one, mm-hmm. get in with the newspaper. You're going to get access to just about everything. Yeah. Well, for me, it was it was it was just a terrific experience because at, at least at Penn State, uh, they had an excellent sort of fine art photography program. And then they had the newspaper. Um, and I was sort of one of the few photographers who was interested in both of those things. And both of those things uh, turned out to be a really good combination where I sort of learned about the art of photography uh, from the art professors. Uh, but at the same time, I was doing actual assignments with deadlines and where I had to actually come up with something that was publishable on a daily basis. So that was a tremendous experience. And and so when I, when I graduated from college, I actually had a a portfolio that I could walk into. Initially, I walked into the uh, Philadelphia Inquirer and got an assignment on the spot. Uh, and then I started working for the AP. And then, uh, you know, it, it just sort of grew from there. I decided, okay, well, you know, I, I would, I saw, you know, I'd cover an assignment and there'd be a New York Times photographer there. And I thought, okay, well, geez, they use photographers in Philadelphia too. So, you know, you just call up the main number and you say, hey, can you tell me, can you connect me with the picture editor? And There's they, no secret. And they do. And, uh, and, you, and, and I said, hey, I'm a photographer in Philadelphia. I work for, I work for the Associated Press. Can I come show you a portfolio? And they, like, and they say, sure. So, so, so uh, for example, a newspaper like the New York Times, they have 10 different photo editors because they've got a real estate department and they've got sports and they've got news and they've got uh, you know, all sorts of different uh, needs for photography. And so, um, so I was able to start working for, for one guy, actually, uh, actually I did a lot of real estate pictures cause this being in the late eighties, uh, real estate was sort of hot and they had a, a regular real estate section where they had regional, uh, real estate articles from around the country. And so it seemed like almost every week they had an article about what was going on in Philadelphia. So they'd send me out and I'd photograph some building and then I'd, pack the film up in a FedEx envelope and ship it off and uh, collect my $200. So, so for a 23 year old, uh, it was good money and it was a lot of fun. Um, and then of course, whenever there was any real news in, in Philadelphia, I covered that for the New York times as well, whether it was politics or crime or sports or, you know, I photographed a lot of army Navy games and, uh, you know, just whatever was happening in Philadelphia. And so, um, so, you know, in terms of getting the assignments, uh, there, it's not, it's, there's no mystery to it. Uh, I mean, these days, uh, it's simply harder to get in to meet with people. Um, but one of the beauties of working as a photojournalist is because is that there's, there's a lot of turnover uh, in photojournalism. There's just, because uh, it frankly doesn't pay that well. So, so photographers come into photojournalism, 
they do their thing and then they either go to grad school or they do go on to some other part of photography. And so there's, there's a pretty steady turnover of photojournalists. So, so all these publications uh, sort of routinely need new photographers. And so it's sort of, an, it's sort of a matter of, of catching a client when, when they need you and then doing a good job when they do call. So for example, I had a situation where um, uh, for the first couple of years uh, at a school, I was interested in working for People Magazine and I'd go up there and show my portfolio and, and they would never call me. Uh, but there was, a, there was a, actually an incident, uh, if you, you're not old enough, for Jared, to remember, but Senator Hines was killed in a helicopter I'm crash. I'm old enough to remember. Um, uh, yeah, how old do you Lower think Marion. I am? I don't know, I think you're about 25. Oh boy. Um, so, so Senator Hines was killed in this, in this crash where and a helicopter. And some kids died on the ground in the playground. It's true. See, I remember yeah. that. Yeah, it was just the craziest incident where they had uh, a small plane and a helicopter crashed over a playground at recess. And so, the, uh, so, so I went and shot that for the New York Times, but also People Magazine needed a whole bunch of sort of aftermath mm-hmm. pictures where we were interviewing and photographing survivors and you know, heroic custodians and all that. And so I was there for them, and then and then that and then they they started using me. You know, I, I worked for them for five or six years after that on a regular basis, and so it's just sort of an example where where you there's a lot of sort of being at the right right place at the right time, and you just have to be really persistent, and you have to be good enough that uh, you know they're going to pay attention to you and think of think of you when when they need you, and then you just got to perform. Sure, and that and that brings us up to wonderful machine. At what point did you decide, hey, I want to create something to help other photographers? Um, I, I think it, the, the idea for it had been bubbling from, from the time I was uh, even in college. Um, I can remember as a young photojournalist, even a student photojournalist, looking at a magazine and seeing these credits like Black Star and Magnum and SEPA and Sigma and Gamma and, um, you know, these sort of uh, very exciting uh, assignments of war photography and these human interest stories, and um, and it was just very interesting to me that, uh, this this idea of that that you could be a freelance photographer but be associated with uh, an agency uh, and having somebody sort of as your advocate, so that when you were out there on your assignments, you could ship film back and they would sort of help you. Uh, manage your career and and look out for you um so i had sort of romantic notions from the start about what a picture agency was um but um but that sort of morphed a little bit over time as i became a a a regular uh working photographer uh I, i end up photographing loads of doctors and lawyers and and other people who had these professional organizations so you've got lawyers have have law firms and doctors have medical practices and I always thought, well, geez, why can't photographers get together and, and do something like that, have a professional group uh, where they can share facilities, share staff, equipment, supplies, insurance. And, um, and it just, I was just not aware of anybody doing that. So I, so I, so I wanted to try that. And, um, and so, so I tried it, uh, unfortunately when we were all still shooting film, mm-hmm. um, I tried it with a couple of guys here in Philadelphia and, uh, and it didn't last long, uh, cause it was, it was just very difficult to reconcile all those expenses. Uh, when you're, when you shoot, uh, film, you know, what we were trying to do was have sort of one studio manager who would go out and buy, buy the film and do all the billing and everything to sort of consolidate the administrative back end of the photography business. But when you've got three or four photographers all shooting film and having it processed and shooting Polaroid and, and you've got other expendables like gels and filter and tape, all of a sudden, uh, it becomes very difficult to reconcile all those expenses to make it sort of fair and equitable for everyone. Um, so that failed. Um, a couple of years later, uh, once we had all sh- shifted to digital, um, I decided to try it again. Um, so I, uh, I had an assistant at that time, a guy named Chris Chrisman, who's uh, quite successful now on his, on his own. Uh, Chris and I, Chris was sort of our... Uh, apprentice number one. Um, and, uh, and we had another guy named Chris Farber, who's now uh, in New York and does multimedia photography. Um, so the three of us, uh, sort of started this little cooperative basically where I, uh, where we shared all that stuff and, uh, and I 
help them get assignments. And uh, we had sort of a revenue sharing deal going. And, um, and we added staff and we ended up adding uh, sort of apprentices who shared, who um, would trade assisting time for use of the equipment and the facilities and all that. Um, and that actually worked out really well for a couple of years. And then out of that grew the wonderful machine that you see now. And you talked about you took uh, commissions then? So at that point, when we were a cooperative, we weren't really taking commissions. We were all essentially owners of the cooperative. So all the money went into a pot and then it split out after yeah, that. Yeah, so, so what we did was uh, on every assignment, we would uh, have a simple, what we call a split sheet, which would show this is the fee and these are the expenses. And the photographer would get paid half of the fee up front and the, and the cooperative would retain the other half. And then, and then we, would, uh, we would pay for all the fixed costs. So we had, we had a studio manager and we had uh, a marketing person and we had rent and we had equipment and insurance and all that stuff. So, so the 50% the that the cooperative retained would go to pay for all the fixed overhead. Um, and, uh, and we never actually came out ahead. So, so basically we, was, we spent that whole 50%. Sure. And then, um, uh, and then, and, and that allowed the photographers uh, to really concentrate on the photography and ha and we had the staff and facilities to allow them to grow as quickly as possible. So now in the, in the modern day of modern machine, wonderful machine, mm -hmm. not modern machine, uh, what, what is the service that you offer? How so, does it all work? Yeah. So what we did was, uh, you know, after, after doing that for a while, we realized that we, we started getting inquiries from photographers, uh, all around the country because we started, we created this brand, wonderful machine, and it was just, uh, three or four photographers in Philadelphia, but we were marketing it nationally. And so we started getting inquiries from other photographers, uh, wanting to know how they can get it, they could get involved. Um, and for, for two solid years, we were sort of pushing them off. We'd, we'd say, you know, we're just a cooperative in Philadelphia. You'd have to move to Philadelphia to join. Um, but, but there sort of became a point where we realized, you know, if we don't do something with this, we're going to be missing out. So we actually sort of shifted our focus away from the co-op or the local cooperative. And we basically reinvented ourselves as a marketing company for photographers. So what we offer is, uh, is for a, for a monthly fee. Uh, so U S based photographers pay $150 a month. And in exchange for that $150 a month, they get a listing on our site, uh, which includes a listing for whatever specialties they're appropriate for. And we list them in, in their actual location. And, uh, and then, and then we integrate them into all of our marketing, uh, process. So, so for example, we do every week we send out a, a, an email blast. Every month we do a print po a, a postcard that we send out to clients. Uh, we do daily phone calls. We do a daily blog post and social media. Every month we do a portfolio event where we alternately go to New York City. Uh, and then uh, on alternate months, we go to other cities all around the United States. We've been to 30 cities uh, showing physical print portfolios. So we'll uh, we'll literally pack up 40 portfolios in Tenba cases and get on an airplane and, and fly to Chicago. And we'll have appointments with mostly ad agencies, uh, but some magazines and graphic design firms and, and others. And we show portfolios. So, so we're basically doing, um, using every possible marketing tool to get our message out. And we do our best to, to strike a balance between saturating the uh, our audience with, with the wonderful machine message, but without oversaturating, you know, we don't want to spam people. We don't want to be obnoxious in our sales techni techniques. We just try to find the right balance where they're going to appreciate hearing from us and know who we are. And what I think that you guys have created is a place for these reps and agencies to not agencies, but the, uh, anybody looking for photographers in terms of the industry, um, you've created a place for them to do a quick search. It's like they know to go to you first to take a look at the photographers that are on your roster. So that's why it really pays to be on the roster. And anybody thinking that $150 a month is a lot of money, it, it, it's a lot of money, but it's all relative. Because you know that if you get a job, you're not only paying for that full year, maybe even more. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that's just where it starts. And I can say that Adam Lerner signed up. I know that Zach Arias is on with you guys as well. I know right. he switched over. Sure. Um, and I can say that Adam, in the first two weeks, picked up 
two gigs right off the bat. Mm-hmm. And it, it may not be the same for everybody, but what Adam's whole reasoning was, I just need to put myself into in, in front of people. Yeah. And that's what it is. As a photographer, you can't just sit by with a nice website and think people are going to all of a sudden find you. Mm-hmm. You have to be put into the right place. So you've created a place that does that and you actively go out and search for these jobs for people. Mm-hmm. It's not like, I mean, you take 40 portfolios, somebody may see something they like and they're like, I like this guy's stuff. Let me give him a call. We've got gigs. I mean, that, it doesn't, that, that's the ultimate for a photographer. Somebody repping you and helping you get gigs mm-hmm. so that you can be a photographer. Sure. Yeah, it's so true. You can't be a photographer and expect, expect people to just sort of magically find you. You have to be actively uh, out there connecting with people. And so, so what we recommend is, is that every photographer have some active marketing uh, and some passive marketing. You know, so, so for example, Wonderful Machine is something you can simply pay to be on, to, to be listed on. And then, and then clients are going to find you. You have to make it easy for clients to find you. Uh, and what we recommend is that you, that client, that photographers think about sort of a, um, a broad message, uh, so that so that any client in the world uh, can find you, and then and then have a much more targeted approach for your active marketing. So, for example, I would say there's probably a hundred thousand clients. Uh, in the world uh, that that use high quality photography on a regular basis, so so we market to those people. Um, that's something that individual photographer can't really uh, can't really do effectively. The way that we the reason that we can be effective at marketing to a hundred thousand clients is because we've got something for everybody. Uh, you know, part of the dilemma as a photographer is how do you pick out from those hundred thousand? How do you pick out the ones that are appropriate for you? Because because you could sort of market, you know, you, there's nothing stopping you from sending out 100,000 emails, um, but it's, mu- it's gonna be much more effective if instead of promoting a little bit to a lot of, photo- a lot of clients, to promote a lot to a very few clients. So, so, so the way we look at it is that we can provide the sort of broad uh, connection to, for photographers to, to to be um, sort of on the radar of every major client, and then the, and then the individual photographer can then create a list of fewer than a thousand clients, and then and then really pursue those clients in a in a much deeper way. And, and it's not you don't just list photographers; you offer other services to help photographers uh, find locations, how to properly bill people. Sure. Yeah. So so about. Um, so about two thirds of our revenue right now is from the the the, the uh, directory part of our site, uh, but but we also offer all sorts of consulting services for photographers, and that's that's the part of our business that's growing the most rapidly. So we've got now uh, seventeen full time staff members on our site. We've got four photo editors, six producers, three designers, and two publicists. And so, so all those people uh, have have responsibilities to maintain the site for for our member photographers, but everybody also uh, is available to help individual photographers on individual projects. So, for example, if a photographer needs help editing the pictures on their website, we've got photo editors who are experienced doing that. We can also edit iPads or print portfolios. We can even physically create physical print portfolios. Uh, we've got designers who do web design that do promo design, both uh, email promos and print promos. Uh, we've, got pr- we've got producers who do uh, marketing plans for photographers, who do list building, who do client meetings. Uh, if, you, if, if you're, for example, a photographer in Chicago and you're spending a couple of days in New York City, uh, it might uh, pay for you to have us or somebody uh, make those calls for you. Uh, sometimes, sometimes sort of an agent uh, is going to have more success getting somebody on the phone and arranging a meeting than an individual photographer. And that's invaluable. So, yeah. And then we do, and then we do about 400 estimates a year and we do shoot production. So a lot of times, uh, photographers, you know, when, uh, when they get an assignment that isn't, uh, their normal thing and they need to figure out what is this worth? How do I quote this job? Uh, it's very hard for an individual photographer to know all sorts of different, uh, ways to, uh, to price jobs because every different type of assignment is going to have a different, uh, expectation of what the costs are and how to structure an estimate. 
And so, so since we do so many uh, estimates of all different kinds, whether it's for magazines or advertising or corporate assignments or record companies or book publishers or you name it, um, we've, we, we understand what these different things are worth. And so we can typically get a photographer more money than they'd be able to get on their own. So that is a fantastic service to have because people, I get nonstop emails. What do I charge for this? What, what is this? And that is what you're helping the photographer do yeah, so that they can focus on photography mm-hmm. and have you guys on the back end helping. It's like, it's kind of like a record company, but better because right. record companies suck. <laughs> and I mean that record companies suck today in the, in the modern form that they are. Mm-hmm. So, um, what is one of the largest jobs that you've helped somebody find? Is there like a major success story out there? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if I, if I want to uh, give too many sort of personal details, but we've, we, we've done, uh, you know, we've, we certainly routinely, uh, do, um, six figure, um, estimates for photographers. Um, and we've, we've, we've produced a number of, you know, hundred thousand dollar plus assignments, uh, one recently for T-Mobile for one of our Los Angeles photographers, uh, that, that was, uh, on the order of an $80,000 fee for a two day shoot wow. and another, uh, 70,000 in expenses. Oh, that sounds good. So, you know, what's, 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 uh, what I found interesting when I first got into this business is how, um, is how much money, you know, on, in, you know, for certain people in this world, um, there's, there's a lot of, be, a lot of money to be made in photography and it's, and it's like a pyramid. There's a, there's a million people making a tiny bit of money as photographers. Um, but there are, uh, you know, as you go up that period pyramid, there are fewer and fewer people making more and more money. Um, and there are f- photographers, um, that are making certainly in the millions of dollars. Uh, you know, we have a number of photographers on our site who, who generate a million plus in revenue a year. And, uh, you know, and certainly the big names that you, that you might think about, um, you know, can easily generate 10 million plus in revenue on your site. Not on our site. I mean, I'm talking about sort of superstars. Oh, the superstars are out yeah. there. So, what? so I mean, the, the the and the thing that drives uh, big dollar assignments in photography is is advertising. Uh, you know, those are all photographers who are doing real um, uh, heavy duty advertising assignments. Where, you know, for example, if you've got um, if you're doing an ad for uh, for a fashion label or a perfume brand or a car brand, if that company is spending tens of millions of dollars on, on ad space that, you know, they've got a lot of money that they can justify spending on the photography. They're going to want the best possible photographer. And so it's just a matter of proportion. Um, so, so if, so if you are spending $10 million on, uh, so for example, a, a one page ad in time magazine, what do you think a one page ad in time magazine costs? Uh, 50 grand, uh, about 175. Wow. So, so let's say, so how many times have you seen, how many times have you opened up? Uh, well, like, so actually, actually, uh, Connie Nast magazines are a good example. So Connie Nast publishes Vanity Fair and Vogue and a bunch of others. And you'll often, if you went to a magazine rack and opened up all the Connie Nast magazines, you'd see a lot of, uh, similar ads. And, um, and so it's not hard if you're, if, if you're spending a uh, hundred thousand dollars plus per page for advertising space, it's not hard to rack up 10, 20, $30 million in media, right? So if you're, if your product is going to spend $30 million on, on print advertising, um, what's the difference whether you spend 5,000 or 50,000 or $500,000 on the photography, it's a drop in the bucket. Sure. And so that's what drives the, the, the value and, uh, and, and what, and, and it's what drives these, these photographic fees. But, um, but on the bottom, you know, at the bottom uh, of the, of the, of the pyramid are photojournalists, you know, and then there's other sort of editorial photographers. Um, and, uh, and then there's corporate sort of in the middle and then advertising at the top. So why don't we look at what, what do you look for in a photographer coming to you? Somebody comes to you today and says, Hey, I'd like to be a part of your team. Um, well, I, I, I get 20 or 25 emails a week from photographers interested in either joining or just hearing more about us. Um, and, and I, I look at every single one of them and, uh, I, I just look through their, mostly their entire website and it's, it's, uh, it's pretty clear pretty quickly whether they're appropriate for us. 
So, uh, so it's for me, it's all about uh, where where are they based, what what kind of specialties do they have, and how good they are. And so, so for me, it's it. There's sort of a sliding scale uh, of uh, you know depending on where they are and what they do. Uh, they've got to be, for example, if you're in, based in New York City where we've got 60 photographers, I'm going to have sort of a higher standard than if you're in Little Rock, Arkansas, you know, the, the standard will be a little bit different. But in the end, what I'm looking for is to only add photographers to our site who are going to bring something unique to our audience. And so I'm thinking to myself, if, if I'm an art buyer and I'm coming to Wonderful Machine, am I going to want to see this photographer or not? And so, so ultimately, uh, it's my job to, to make the site as valuable as possible to art directors and art buyers and photo editors. And if I look at this photographer and think, okay, well, they're just, they're just diluting, diluting what we already offer, uh, or if they're not, frankly, good enough, or, or they're not really offering anything different enough, uh, then I'm not going to be interested. Um, but I do, I've had, I have had uh, sort of periodic email correspondence with some photographers over a period of years where uh, some photographers uh, have approached, uh, I've, I've some situations where a photographer approached me four years ago, actually somebody I just brought on the site recently, um, and, and about every year he would send me an update and I would, you know, give him a few thoughts uh, about what he was doing, what he was shooting, how he was, how he was organizing his website. And, uh, and, and, and I've seen a number of photographers make steady progress to the point where, uh, where I can feel comfortable putting them on our site. You know what you said there, though? N- nothing wrong with it. Four, five years time. What a lot of photographers watching sometimes forget is that this doesn't happen overnight. Right. It, you may have just started out. I mean, two years. I've. I started shooting at 13. It's 18 years ago at this point, so I'm older than 25. It's, um, it's, it's a long haul. I mean, that, but that's the point. Once you get in, then it, you're working your ass off, and, and that, it takes years to do this. Mm-hmm. And there's so many other photographers now that what you bring to the table is a great opportunity if you can get in or when you can get in to really do something with your photography. Mm-hmm. So that, that's tremendous and I, I still have the I have the form over there it's on my machine does huh. that mean I've been picked like you 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 would accept me if I filled out that form fully yeah, now if, if you've got the form that means that you've been picked I still have the form it's sitting <laughs> on the printer I have printed it out I just have to pull the trigger and, and officially do it because I want to get those jobs yeah I think the catalyst there is seeing Adam have success early right doesn't mean that it translates to me having success mm-hmm. I know that you don't have a lot of music photographers on the website mm-hmm. I fit that niche extremely well yeah if I might say so um, well, you've, you've picked a very competitive thing to do music, what music music photography that's fine yeah I take reportage I do I do what tell stories mm-hmm. we'll see what happens right. you never know you never know yeah we'll see but we're certainly not a magic bullet I mean we're no. it's not it's not you know sometimes uh, we'll have photographers uh, join and then um, and then they're not they're you know a month later i get an email and it's like hey nothing's happened yet and it's like it's a month you know i mean sometimes you know everybody everybody has a different experience and we do have people that drop off the site um uh, i i think that if you were to compare us to other similar directories out there that we compare pretty favorably in terms of what we charge and what we offer but uh but certainly not everybody finds uh success sure and it, and it does take time. A month in is kind of like, give something time. What are you doing on the end? It's like, right. you can't stop working once you show up to your site. You have to keep shooting. You have to keep promoting yourself. And, sure. it, and, it, and it works. You work hand in hand. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're one little piece of any photographer's marketing puzzle, and, but we're not going to be the whole piece. Sure. And, 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 and one of the things we offer is a marketing plan where we can look at a photographer's existing marketing materials and what they're, what they're currently doing to promote themselves. And we can give them advice on, on how to, uh, not only, not only what, what to do with their marketing materials and, and, and to create a, uh, a sensible plan to get the material out there, but even taking a step back and looking at a photographer's actual brand, the idea of who they are as a photographer and have a conversation about, okay, is this what's appropriate for you? Um, because a lot of photographers sort of get it in their head that, um, that they want to do this thing and, and, and they're, sometimes their, their websites are saying their website is saying something else. And so we try and reconcile, uh, what the photographer's interests are, what their skills are, 
and what the possibilities are out there in the marketplace uh, and, and reconcile those three things uh, to sort of reorient or reposition a photographer so that, uh, so that, so that every, everything else can really follow from there. You know, all your branding and all your marketing efforts um, are sort of wasted if you're, if you're not really clear up front on who you are as a photographer and what kind of clients you're trying to reach. Sure. Uh, where's the future? Where, where do you see you guys going in the next five years? Um, well, w- right now we're just paying attention to doing our daily work of uh, promoting our photographers and growing our consulting. Uh, we're just about to relaunch. Uh, in the next couple of weeks, we're relaunching our consulting page. Uh, we had it redesigned to uh, to allow for a lot more uh, content uh, and a lot and and a lot more ease of uh, sw- swapping in new content. Uh, f- to, that describes all the different consulting projects that we do for photographers. So it's really primarily about growing our consulting services because um, there's, um, there's a tremendous demand for it and there's really nobody else in the industry that does it. And as far as I know, we're the only company that has these photo editors and designers and publicists and producers uh, under one roof and, and that we know how to work sort of cooperate with each other. Uh, so we're sort of taking a hospital approach to photographers instead of a photographer having to, having to go one place for their graphic design and another place for an edit and a third place for their marketing plan. Uh, we really, we offer that under one roof and it's integrated. All those people that are doing those different tasks understand each other's, uh, job so that we can sort of seamlessly, um, offer these services that that are uh, covering everything you need to cover and they're not overlapping and uh, it's just all integrated. So so that's our biggest challenge right now is just making that all work really well. Um, beyond that, uh, I mean, I, I have lots of ideas for other companies I want to start um, and I have uh, ideas about how I want to grow. Um, some I can talk about, some I can't. Um, we, uh, we briefly, a few years ago had a company called cake and pictures, which was sort of a wedding photographers, um, version of wonderful machine. And so I'm, I'm toying with the idea of, of resurrecting that we sort of put that on the back burner, uh, for a while because I just wanted to concentrate our efforts on wonderful machine. Um, but, but there are, uh, a tremendous number of wedding photographers, uh, and, and there's, there's, there's the knot really, uh, to find wedding photographers. But beyond that, uh, you know, I feel like, I feel like we have an opportunity to, uh, bring the same expertise and the same sort of searchable database and same, same idea of this sort of curated mix of photographers, uh, to the wedding photographer business. Um, but, um, but that's still in the future. Yeah. It just takes some time. So do you want to tell people where they can find out more information? Well, just on our site, if you go to wonderfulmachine.com, uh, we have two parts of our site. There's the search interface, which is what comes up first. And then if you click on blog, uh, you, we have a section called How We Help Photographers, and that explains everything we do to promote our photographers. And, and if you're interested in joining, and you know, if, you, if you look at our website and you uh, realistically think that you're appropriate for us, um, simply send me an email. Just uh, send an email to bill at billkramer.com, and my email address is on our contact page uh, and on our How, How We Help Photographers page. So just send me an email and uh, tell me where you live and send me a link to your website, and I will look at it and, and, and reply to you uh, sooner or later. Sounds good to me. I think we're there. Okay. I think we've reached the end. Thank awesome. you very much for taking the time. Hey, it was my pleasure, Jared. It, it's, uh, it's a fun site to look at, especially if you're trying to figure out how you compare to other people that are getting jobs in the world. Right. So you can definitely search that out. But anyway. Awesome. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks. Thanks. And we'll be right back. How was that interview? Did you like that? I liked it because I didn't have to say very much. And if you notice, there weren't a lot of interruptions. Bill had a ton of information there. Um, Really, I what'd you think? Because you listened to the whole thing. I thought it was great. I I had no idea about that website or, or what it offered. And now just he ran down every little specific detail that they offered and all the every service they offer, which kind of blew my mind. Well, I I you know I have trouble building those proposals out for people. And he said it. He's like, we have a way of not a way of, but they do we it tend for you, to get more like. money for a photographer because we put together the we know what what works so you would basically pay them a a, a service fee if you're a part of the roster um and they'd help you create the proposal and 
you'd submit it. So you pay them for whatever that time is, which is worth it, especially if you get the job. And there you go. So that's just one aspect of what they do. I love that because if somebody calls and is like, hey, I need you to come do this. And you're like, um. Well, and, and the fact that he had the photo editors, photo editors on like standby, which was really nice. Like there's so many times where I could just throw some pictures to them and, and have them work for you, you know? Yeah. And that, that's what's good is that they, uh, they'll, they'll help you make the best website. They'll help you um, select the right images on there, help you with your branding and marketing, which we know how important that is, especially talking about the whole Gary Vaynerchuk yeah. thing with the jab, 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 right hook book. <laughs> that rhymes. Um, but it, it's a gr- it's a great place to be. I know that Zach Arias is on there, and I believe he's pretty happy with it. I know that Adam Lerner just started two weeks ago and has already picked up two gigs. And I, that may not happen for everybody. Yeah. I may sign and up. That, and Bill said that. Too, yeah. I may sign up and may never get a gig because my work may not be what somebody's looking for. You yeah. never know. And that's just is what it is. Um, mm-hmm. But I think it's worth an opportunity for me to do. And anybody out there who thinks that they are capable of being on that site... Go ahead and send Bill an email, and, and you never know. It may be a great place to be. My the, the, the biggest thing in my mind, the biggest like trigger that, that was like, this is a good place to be, is the fact that they have 700 photographers. You're not competing against 700. You're now one of the 700. Yeah. So it's instead like you're of, almost like a team. In one place. So if you don't get a gig this time, well... It's subjective. You don't know what that ad, that that art buyer is looking for. Yeah, it depends so, on what your your niche is, right? Or and it may and be. the next art buyer coming along may be like, "I like your work over this guy's work." But out of seven hundred people, you have a high, much higher percentage than if somebody's just searching for you on Google and they can't discover you. It's about being discovered. Oh yeah. So, I enjoyed it. Yeah. I hope you guys good. enjoyed it. Check them out. Wonderful machine, I believe, is wonderful. Wonderfulmachine dot mm-hmm. I want to thank Stephen again for his help here. Thank you. We had the gear You're of the welcome. week with that Rode microphone. Don't forget squarespace.com slash fro. You get a 14-day free trial no matter what. And if you decide you want to check out or use their service after those 14 days, go ahead and use code fro10. That's for October. The 10 stands for the month. And you'll get 10% off your first order. So that means if you only sign up for one month, you'll get 10% off that one month. And if you sign up for a year, you'll get 10% off signing up for a year. So definitely check them out. Uh, big thanks to Alan's camera again, as always. If you're looking for uh, computer stuff, the computer stuff. Oy, oy, oy. <laughs> if you're looking for anything camera related, Nikon, Canon, they do have Olympus in stock. There's Leicas. They've got all the, they actually have Leica glass in stock all wow. the time. Um, check them out. Alan'scamera.com. Go visit them in Levittown, PA, like we did at Nikon Alan's Palooza. And um, I think I'm going to wrap it up, Stephen. Nice. So for all the photo, nice, nice sounding. You sound very nasally right now. I know. For uh, my, my sickness for, is slowly taking over. Ooh, I'm, I'm, I'm down with the sickness. <laughs> ooh, I'm down with the sickness. <laughs> That's disturbed. Yes, I know who that is. Ooh, I'm, I'm down <clears throat> with the sickness. <laughs> what happened to them? They made a lot of money in the nineties. And in then two, they, sorry, in the two thousands. Yeah, they're still going around. Yeah, I know a guy who does. He does uh, guitar off the side of the. Don't stage. they have a new singer or something? I thought. No, I that was live. No, I know live, but I thought it was, I thought Disturbed too as well had oh, some do kind they of, really? Maybe I'm thinking uh, of a different band. I don't know. Yes, they're just one of those bands. Yeah. All right, guys, that's Raw Talk episode number 54. For all of the photo news, be sure to check out the podcast page, fronosphoto.com slash podcast. Please subscribe on iTunes is a great place that I recommend so that the you can take us with you in your pocket like a pocket rocket. We could be there with you. And and if you subscribe, it will automatically let you know when new episodes go live. We like to put them live. Uh, we try to hit Monday at midnight. That's Monday at midnight. So as soon as you For wake the up... video. Well, no, that's the audio. Oh, you're right. Monday at Technically, midnight. Technically, it's, yeah. So 12 p.m. No, 12, 12 a.m. on Monday. On Monday, Eastern Standard Time. So that's midnight. Uh, and then by and Tuesday sometime, we like to put up the video to go with it. So if you want to download it, listen to it in the car, you can go ahead and do that. We even offer the MP3 on the site. And that is it. Jared Poland, froknowsphoto.com. See ya. See ya.